this is a series about Jenkins, GitLab, and Docker. So let's switch to the browser. First of all, you need to understand what I'm going to achieve. I will try to explain this, right? Let's say this is a Jenkins servers. Arrange insert text, and it will be Jenkins master server. Well, right, this one. Uh, I'll try to make a text bigger. Uh, um, let's see, 24, something like that. Right, this is a Jenkins master server. So now, and this is um. Next text, orange, insert a, it's a git lab server. Okay, 24. And this one will be a docker slave server, something like that. Okay. And yeah, here we go. What I want to do actually, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, and this is fine. Something like that. And this, I want to create a connection between the Jenkins master and the GitLab server in both direction, actually, and between the Jenkins master server and the Docker slave server, and of course, between the Docker slave server, actually, and the GitLab server. So how everything is working, actually, mm, I will explain during the presentation, but this is the crucial step to understand it. So you need to you need three machines, and the best idea is to have all in the same subnet. But of course, they can be in separate subnets. It doesn't matter at all, and it depends on you just how you will configure the network. But the main thing is that Jenkins. It's uh, just a machine that is running jobs, nothing more. Okay. So what it is actually doing? It is connecting to the GitLab server. In the GitLab server, you have a repository where you store Jenkins file. Inside this Jenkins file, there is a pipeline created. I will pr present in a moment how pi pipeline looks like. Uh, of course, and after that, the pipeline says to use a Docker file that is also located in the same um, repository, or it can be in a different repository, it doesn't matter at all. And it goes to the Docker file, the Docker file says what configuration need to be created, I mean, how exactly the Docker container should be created and what settings should be set inside. And also what um, in, into the container you, you have to download. I mean, for example, what kind of repository you need to download to the container, right? And after that, it will run the test in the Docker container, save the result, and at the end, the job on the Jenkins master server will shut down the Docker container, and all the results will be visible in the Jenkins server. So there will be a report. If you want to have an artifact like that, so you can, for example, do all the work in Docker container, save to some directory, um, I mean, save results into files and put those files into directory, compress the directory, and then the compressed directory can be attached as an artifact to a Jenkins job. 
And of course, there is also something what we call HTML report. So there can be also a report uh, how the job has been done. And all the results, all the results from tests will be available in Jenkins. So quite easy. This is the whole uh, configuration. And how it is working? Um, it is creating, yeah, and the Docker file, it's um, running, it's opening a container, it's creating a container on a Docker slave server. And actually the Jenkins is doing it, but um, Jenkins need to get the Docker file through the Jenkins file pipeline to know how exactly create a Docker. Yeah, which settings should be set, uh, like, um, for example, network configuration, which packages needs to be downloaded, for example, git to make this work, I mean, to let the Docker container to be able to download the reposit the test repository, because one repository in GitLab server is just a repository that contains a Docker file and Jenkins file, and the second one is a kind of test, right? that is testing something. For example, it's testing a website and it, click, it can click for the user some parts, it's doing it automatically and all the results goes to the file. And this is how it works. I mean, the, the whole thing is automated. So it is running actually without the um, errors uh, from, from a human size, right? Because, um, we usually do all those things and we create jobs and then eventually there's something wrong. We, um, of course, fix all those stuff and to, to make sure that everything is working correctly. I mean, the, the whole job is running correctly. The container is creating correctly and the whole test is passed and, um, it's result, the result is correct and there's no issue. Um, actually on a job site in Jenkins and Docker site. And eventually the only one thing that can make, that can happen and that, that will, that usually happens, that is why we are writing tests, um, is that if it is testing some functionalities and the functionality is not working properly, then the result will be uh, saved into the file. And thanks to this, we know that the test didn't pass because something is wrong actually and the functionality is not working as expected according to the good practice or you know um, those um regulations and all those uh, things that should be done correctly and sometimes it happens that person or the team that is writing the code they just, you know, they didn't ever think I expect that. And they, you know, sometimes people forget about this or just they think that, okay, that this function will, will work, but someone who is performing tests needs to have a knowledge how to test it properly and to catch those exceptions, you know, all those conditions um, must be correctly checked. This, this is the reason why we are performing tests of the code, actually. And this is how it works in the production and in, in the test and dev and production environment. So um, in the beginning, we are testing in test environment, then it goes to the developer environment, right? And after that, when everything is correct and everything is checked, we are releasing the code and we create a stable version. So usually you have uh, something like we can alpha beta versions in test environment. In the dev environment, we have something like release candidate. So it's a version that is before the stable and usually release candidates are released and for testing purpose for our people. And after that, the stable version is the version that is tested the most and there is nothing wrong, uh, usually. I mean, the, everything is working stable and correctly, but sometimes it happens that someone is reporting an issue, so we need to release a fix. And it is in the middle of the whole coding. Mm, 
emas and all the how to explain it all the tasks that we are working usually on some code we are coding we are testing yeah and there are prices but if there is a fix then sometimes we need to stop for a moment we need to release quickly fix to the stable version and then we can go back we can return to our uh, work that's how it's usually it looks like sometimes it depends of course on the company and the company decides um, how we work actually and we also can decide uh, what strategy uh, we can uh, to use and how we want to work and uh, how to properly divide all those tasks between uh, members in the team so that's that's the reason um okay so that's all for now and i would like to thank you very much for this introduction i hope that i explain it the the reason why i want to um, create a tutorial about this and we can go further to the next lesson thank you have a nice day bye